Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. In my last video, I talked about how tires support the weight of a car. It generated a bit of controversy, especially relative to the analogy I used of a bicycle wheel, which I promise to address in a future video. So if you haven't seen it yet, you can check it out here. I do suggest you watch it first because we are going to use some of the same concept discussed in that video here today. That's because I want to talk about something I know many of you have noticed about some track and autocross cars. And that is that they tend to run very aggressive negative camber angles in their front suspension. Why is that? What benefit would they be getting from this? The people who build these cars aren't dumb, so what do they know that others don't? Well, today we're going to explore this and see what's going on. Hello everyone, I'm Hubert Mace. And this is Suspensions Explained. As I mentioned in the intro, many of you have noticed that many race cars and autocross cars in particular have very high negative front camber angles. This car here is a perfect example. You can tell how much more camber angle the front wheel has when you compare it to the rear. Here is another one that very clearly shows both front wheels angled very aggressively. Same with this one. Remember that when I'm talking about camber, I'm talking about the angle of the wheels when viewed from the front. Zero camber angle means the wheels are perfectly vertical, while positive camber means the top of the tire is outboard relative to the bottom. And negative camber means the top of the tire is inboard relative to the bottom. All cars that I am aware of or have worked on will have a small amount of negative camber in the front and slightly more negative camber in the rear. The reasons we have these camber angles is this. In the case of driving in a straight line, things are pretty simple. You want the tire to be as close to vertical as possible so that the contact patch is square, which gives best traction for acceleration and braking. Too much negative camber angle would lead to lifting of the outer edge of the tire and greater wear on the inside edge. Not very desirable unless you really enjoy replacing your tires often. In the case of cornering, however, things get more complicated. When a car enters a corner, it rolls in the direction of the outside of the corner. This roll motion takes a suspension with it. So for every degree that the body rolls, the wheels on the outside of the turn tilt a degree in the positive camber direction. However, as the body rolls, the wheels on the outside of the turn move up relative to the body. What suspension engineers will do is design their suspension such that as the wheel moves up, the camber angle increases in the negative direction. You can see it here in this model. As the suspension moves up, the camber angle gets more and more negative. It's called camber compensation. Let's look at an example to see how this works in a car. Let's assume we have a car that has a roll gradient of 3 degrees per G, meaning that when we corner at 1 G, the body will roll 3 degrees. 3 degrees doesn't sound like much, but this is a very typical value for a modern sports sedan. If the track width is 1.6 meters, also very typical for sports sedans like a BMW 5 Series, then at 1 G cornering, the outside wheel will have moved up relative to the body by 42 millimeters or 1.65 inches. Most car suspensions will be designed to have camber compensation on the order of 0.02 degrees per millimeter. That's a very typical value, meaning that for every millimeter the suspension moves up, the camber angle will change by 0.02 degrees. In our example, where the suspension has moved up 42 millimeters, the camber angle will have changed by 42 times 0.02 or 0.84 degrees. So as the body rolls 3 degrees, the suspension has reduced camber by 0.85 degrees, so the total change in actual camber will be 3 minus 0.85 or 2.16 degrees. So you can see how camber compensation reduces the effect of body roll on camber angle in a turn. In order to reduce this effect even further, suspension designers will specify a small amount of negative camber in their alignment specs. Something on the order of negative 0.5 to negative 1 degree for the front and around negative 1 to negative 2 degrees for the rear. Not too much, otherwise you might get too much tire wear, but just a little bit to help reduce the camber in a turn even more. Of course, 
We could design a suspension that has much greater camper compensation so that it negates the effect of body roll completely. But then we run into another problem. In a regular car, we have to deal with very different loading conditions. Everything from a single driver to a full load of passengers and all their luggage in the trunk. As the car gets loaded up, the body moves down and the suspension will move up relative to the body. If we had a lot of camber compensation, the camber angle under those conditions would be much too high and our tires would wear very quickly. There would also be much less traction for acceleration and more importantly braking since the contact patch would be very misshaped. Why then do many manufacturers specify a higher negative camber angle in the rear than in the front? We'll see in a moment why this is. But what does all this have to do with race cars? In a dedicated race car, we could design a suspension with a lot of camber compensation since we don't have to deal with a large variation in loading conditions. But then again, race cars usually have very stiff suspensions so they don't roll very much in a turn. What then can we make of these race cars that have a high negative camber, particularly in the front? While I am no expert in setting up race cars, what these drivers and car builders are doing is making use of the fascinating characteristics tires have. When a tire rolls down the road at zero camber angle, it rolls pretty much in a straight line. It's not exactly straight because of variations in the tread pattern, but it is essentially a straight line. But when a tire rolls down the road at some camber angle, it wants to move and turn in the direction of the angle. In other words, if the tire is cambered or tilted to the left, the tire wants to push and turn to the left. And if it is cambered to the right, then it wants to push and turn to the right. The force that wants to push the tire towards the direction it is tilted in is called camber thrust. And the moment that wants to turn the tire towards the tilt direction is called aligning torque. Personally, I've known about the existence of camber thrust and aligning moment for a long time, but I never knew exactly what happens in a tire to create these forces. So to learn how all this works, I got in touch with some experts, including engineers at Michelin's US engineering facility in South Carolina, as well as Damien Hardy, who together with Mike Blundell authored the book, The Multibody Systems Approach to Vehicle Dynamics. If you haven't read this book and are interested in a much deeper analysis of vehicle dynamics, you should definitely get it. I'll leave a link to it in the description. What I'm presenting to you here is what I learned from them. When a tire rolls down the road vertically, both the inner and outer sidewalls are compressed about the same amount. This means the contact patch is fairly symmetrical and the amount of deradialization and counter deflection happening in both sidewalls is also about the same. Each sidewall generates about the same amount of drag or rolling resistance in this case. But now, if we tilt the tire, the deflection of the inner sidewall becomes greater and the outer sidewall becomes smaller. This leads to a very deformed contact patch. This diagram from Hardy and Blundell's book shows what is happening. Imagine two points, point A and point C, located opposite each other on the inner and outer edges of the tread. As the tire rolls at zero camber angle, both points A and C come into contact with the ground at the same time, shown here by points A prime and C prime. They also pass through the contact patch parallel to each other. But if the tire is tilted, then point A will come into contact with the ground before point C does, shown here by points A double prime and C double prime. Also, Point A will spend a longer amount of time stuck to the ground than point C does because it has a larger portion of the contact patch to pass through. The ground tries to stretch the contact patch in the area of point A and shrink it in the area of point C, but the contact patch doesn't want to be stretched or shrunk. The steel belts inside the tire are very stiff and resist this pushing and pulling. What happens then is the part of the contact patch that is being stretched wants to pull the tire back, and the part that is shrunk wants to push the tire forward. But since the shape of the contact patch is actually not symmetrical, the net result is a moment that wants to turn the tire inward. It takes a little leap of faith to accept what I'm saying here because the math is very complicated and I wouldn't claim to understand it all, but people much smarter than me have figured this out. <laughs> 
But I believe there may be another phenomenon going on here that is much easier to wrap our heads around, although its impact is likely to be much smaller than what we've just discussed. Since the two sidewalls are seeing very different amounts of deflection, the amounts of deradialization and counterdeflection each sidewall is experiencing must also be different. And since the deradialization is a source of rolling resistance, it means the inner and outer sidewalls are generating different levels of drag on the tire. With the drag from the inner sidewall being greater than the drag from the outer sidewall, the difference between the two will create a moment that wants to rotate the tire in the direction of the tilt. The difference in the amount of deradialization between the inner and outer sidewalls will be limited by the fact that they are connected to each other by the belts, which do not want to deform, just like their stiffness resisted the pushing and pulling we talked about earlier. But there will still be some difference, and this will add to the aligning moment the tire is generating. So that is the aligning moment generated by a tilted tire. It is constantly trying to steer the tire in the direction of the tilt, and the suspension and steering system must constantly fight this in order to keep the car moving in a straight line. Now let's talk about camber thrust. We've talked about a moment that wants to steer the tire, but the word thrust suggests there's also a force present. To understand where this force is coming from, we need to remember from my video about how a tire supports load that the weight of the car is held up by tension in the cords at the top of the tire. These cords are pulling up on the wheel via the bead wire. But since the cords at the top of the tire tilt along with the rest of the tire, the force they exert must always lie in the plane of the tire and must also tilt. Tilt the tire and the force exerted by the top cords will also tilt. The weight of the car, on the other hand, is still vertical. This means there is an angle difference between the weight of the car and the force the tire generates to hold up that weight. What we now need to do is think of the force in the tire not as a single force, but as the product of two forces, one which is vertical and is holding up the weight of the car, and one at 90 degrees to it. This 90 degree force is called the camber thrust. And the sides of this force will be directly related to the angle of the tire and the weight of the car. Increase the camber angle, or increase the weight of the car, and you will increase the camber thrust. So now we have two things happening as a result of camber angle. We have a moment trying to steer the tire towards the angle of tilt, and we have a force pushing in the direction of tilt. But in a car, we have wheels on both sides, and if they both sit at the same camber angle, then the aligning moments and the camber thrusts will be in opposite directions and will cancel each other out, and we're left with nothing. What's the point? None of this explains why some race cars have such high camber angles, nor does it explain why we see it mostly in the front. All of that is true when driving in a straight line. The forces coming from the left and right tires do cancel each other out, and we're left with nothing. But as soon as we enter a corner, we get weight transfer to the outside tires. Now, the forces generated by the left and right camber angles are no longer equal. The camber thrust generated by the outside tire suddenly becomes greater and helps to steer the car into the turn. Adding camber on the front tire makes the car very responsive and quick to turn in. Of course, we, once we are in a turn, body roll takes over and we may actually end up with the outside wheel camber changing to positive and the camber thrust going the opposite direction. But under these conditions, the contact patch shape is dominated by the corning forces, not the weight of the car. It's all about how this initial camber angle uses camber thrust to get a sharper and more immediate turn in. This is a lot of why you see such high camber angles on these race cars. It is also why suspension engineers on streetcars use higher camber angles in the rear suspension than in the front. A streetcar doesn't need to turn in so sharply. In fact, if it did, it would be difficult to drive smoothly in a straight line. While camber thrust helps the front suspension turn in, it actually resists turning in at the rear. It adds a temporary bit of understeer and gives the rear suspension support when entering in quarter. It makes the car feel more planted than it would without that extra camber. Well, I hope you found this interesting. I know I did when I learned about it. Tires are immensely complex devices. They are definitely not just round and black. They are, in fact, by far the most complex parts of the suspension system. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you next time for more Suspensions Explained.